Wonderful. Well, the first lunch bunch of the new year. And exciting news is that we're going to do this on a monthly basis. So not just every other month, every month. So thank you to UTMB for providing a wonderful lunch and getting helping to organize all of this. Um, it's really just fabulous. Another shout out to the Oliver Center who helps fund us having this videotape. So this is available. You don't have to feel like you have to take notes because you'll be able to go to the Lunch Bunch website and have a replay of this wonderful talk we're about to hear today. So Lunch Bunch under the UTMB website and uh, you should be able to look at not only this one but some of the other wonderful presentations that we've had um, over the last, um, this is a, our uh, going under our third year of having the Lunch Bunch. Goes, time goes quickly. Woo. So I would just really love to thank Dr. Burberry, who is here to educate us all about cardiovascular disease, kind of the risk factors, and also some of the guidelines that have really recently gone under some major overhauls. So it's wonderful to have him. He actually did his, his medical school at UTMB, and that was, he finished up in 2001. So He's been out and then up in Dallas the majority of the time um, where he did his internal medicine residency and also a cardiology fellowship up in Dallas. He was working in Dallas um, at Baylor and then also in a specialty group in cardiology. One of the interesting things that I saw um, that he's done in the past is really worked on cardiac rehabilitation with industrial athletes. Industrial athletes, I thought, what is that? Is that like the, you know, the runner? You know, if you're at you're at you're at a plant, you need to get a message from here to here, and email's not working. But it's actually the firefighters and the police officers that are industrial athletes. And so after they have some kind of myocardial infarction, he gets them up and going, and probably back to work. So wonderful work that he's done. We're so fortunate to have him back at UTMB, and he's been here since the fall, and uh, practices just right next door down here at the multi-specialty center, at town center, and also in Texas City. Unfortunately, he did not bring cards today. Mm -hmm. Write down his name. Mm -hmm. You will want to come and see him. <laughs> And um, also, uh, again, you'll be able to have access to um, this on videotape and can, if you don't have your pen and paper, can write down his name at that point. So without further ado, I just want to thank you so much for being here to educate. That's another one of the things that he loves to do is to educate. And uh, we're very fortunate to have you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you very much for that very nice introduction. Th thank you all for having me. I'm delighted to be here. And uh, the title of my talk today is Risk Factors for Heart Disease, and this is a new numbers game. When I agreed to do this talk a few months ago, I wasn't even aware that over the next couple of months, the guidelines for blood pressure and cholesterol management were going to undergo some dramatic changes. So as those things started coming down uh, and released in the press, uh, and as I've been reviewing uh, these guidelines myself, I got very excited that I was scheduled to do this talk talking about risk factors because then we can talk about these new uh, changes. Many of you have probably read about this, heard about this in the news, and so uh, we'll be able to get into those questions. I want to keep things very informal. Uh, we have plenty of, I've budgeted plenty of time here for questions. So if you want to interrupt me, please raise your hand and do that. That's, that's absolutely fine. So this is what we want to prevent with these risk factors that we'll be talking about uh, today. Uh, these risk factors end up causing plaque development in the arteries all over our body, uh, in the brain, in the heart, and in the, in the periphery, in our systemic circulation. So plaque uh, in uh, the brain arteries uh, can end up causing strokes. Plaque in the heart arteries ends up leading to heart attack that can eventually lead to congestive heart failure. And then plaque and blockages in our leg arteries can end up causing PAD or peripheral arterial disease that can lead to crampy leg pain when you walk. This can be a very disabling, limiting symptom. 
Uh, so all of these things we're talking about today lead to these complications and, and this is what I, I hope and try to prevent in my patient population. So uh, it was mentioned that I'm from Dallas and I am going to stay a Cowboys fan I'm afraid even though I'm down here and, and we had the uh, we had the big three in the early 90s of Michael Irvin, Emmett Smith, and Troy Aikman, and, and I have my big three in the cardiovascular uh, disease area that I need to uh, worry about, and that's uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, and cholesterol. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, there have been some very recent, here in the last couple of months, guideline changes to cholesterol and blood pressure management. These guidelines were written by national experts that spent uh, a lot of time together combing over all of the uh, recent uh, data that has, that has come out. Um, these changes are big changes. When I graduated from medical school in 2001, uh, I've practiced under the same guidelines over the last 12 years, uh, I guess there's 12, 13 years. Uh, so these changes are new. They've examined, these guideline writing committees examined a lot of data, a lot of studies that have been released over that time period in the last 10 to 12 years and realized that there were some changes and updates that needed to happen. So, so they did that. There were big changes to medications, when to start therapy, how to follow patients. We're going to talk about all of the above when we get into the individual risk factors. So first, one uh, risk factor that hasn't undergone a big change is diabetes. While I don't treat that directly, that is a big risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So what is diabetes? Well, I think that's depicted nicely here in this drawing. Uh, insulin is a hormone uh, that our pancreas secretes to help sugar or glucose get inside our body cells. So insulin then binds to receptors on our body cells which then allows glucose to enter in our cells and get out of our bloodstream. So what happens in diabetes? Couple of things. One is the insulin becomes deficient, so we don't have enough insulin to uh, produce to, to in order to promote glucose uptake in cells. And the other thing that can happen, this is much more common in our adult patient population, is insulin resistance. So these receptors end up becoming resistant to the hormone insulin. Even though you have plenty of it, your cells don't recognize it. They become resistant to the hormone. And so this then promotes increased blood sugar levels. This leads to diabetes. So first number to know is diabetics have blood sugar levels that are too high. A fasting plasma glucose that you get on a blood work, on blood testing, of more than 126 on two different occasions gives us our diagnosis of diabetes. A diabetes is very serious. It increases your risk of developing cardiovascular disease. And actually, we consider diabetics as having heart blockages already. So we're, we get very aggressive about risk, other risk factor prevention in our diabetic patient populations. We take symptoms of chest pain and shortness of breath very seriously in our diabetic patient population because we assume that they already have some degree of coronary artery disease or heart blockages. Hopefully not significant like this, but we already expect them to have at least 20 to 30 percent narrowing in their heart arteries because diabetes carries this such high risk. Now even when glucose levels are under control, diabetes increases the risk of heart disease and stroke. However, the risks are even greater if our blood sugar is not well controlled. So even though you've got an increased risk with the diabetes, we still want to get those blood sugar levels uh, uh, as normal as we can. 75% uh, of people with diabetes die of some form of heart or blood vessel disease. So that's a pretty startling number to me. So we want to treat this aggressively and treat high blood sugars with a combination of medications and insulin. Uh, we want to also treat uh, concurrent risk factors that the patient often has, like high blood pressure. New guideline is keeping the blood pressure less than 140 over 90. Used to be one, keeping it less than 130 over 85. That underwent a recent change. We'll talk about that more in a moment. And then cholesterol treatment. Really all diabetics should be on what we call statins. Statins are the cholesterol-lowering medications, and we'll talk about those more in detail here in a little bit. So let's talk about high blood pressure as the next big risk factor of cardiovascular disease, and I, and I like this cartoon drawing here. Uh, high blood pressure increases the heart's workload. It causes the heart to thicken and become stiffer. It's like putting a wrench around your heart. The heart can still squeeze. You can imagine it's still squeezing normally, but when it's supposed to relax and fill with blood, it cannot because of the consequences of having high blood pressure. These become worse, these become um, uh, much more uh, pronounced in patients who have uncontrolled high blood pressure for many, many years. 
So this increases your risk of stroke, heart attack, kidney failure, and congestive heart failure. When high blood pressure exists with other risk factors like obesity, being overweight, smoking, high blood cholesterol levels or diabetes, then your risk of heart attack or stroke goes up several more times. So these are additive. These risks add together to end up causing even more problems. So high blood pressure, as many of you know, is also known as hypertension. It's written as two numbers when you get this reported to you in your doctor's office, such as 112 over 78 millimeters of mercury. So the top number is the systolic reading. This number is the pressure when the heart beats. The bottom, or the diastolic number, is the pressure when the heart rests between the beats. Normal blood pressure is 120 over 80. So even though we want to treat to less than 140 over 90 in most patients, it's important to realize that your risk of having um, uh, these complications of high blood pressure start to increase even past 120 over 80. And that's, I'm going to show you that here in this slide. This is systolic blood pressure here, diastolic blood pressure over here on, on your uh, right, and systolic blood pressure here on the left. Uh, as you can see, as the numbers, they're increasing here, going from left to right on the screen. Uh, as that number increases, your risk of cardiovascular death goes up for both the systolic or the diastolic. So we want to treat both numbers very aggressively. That's why just because the top number is okay and the bottom number is high, that doesn't mean you're all right. We need to treat that diastolic reading. So here, let's get into these new guidelines now that have been released. This is just from last month. Um, uh, he, uh, published in the Journal of the American, uh, published in JAMA, Jour Journal of the American Medical Association. Uh, if you're more than 60 years old, then the treatment starts for systolic blood pressure of more than 150 or the diastolic blood pressure of more than 90. And then we want to treat the blood pressure to less than 150 over 90, again, if you are over 60. Now, if you're less than 60, then the blood pressure cutoff to start treatment and the goal we want to get to is 140, less than 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury. I want to emphasize these first two top bullets. Since I've been a practicing doctor all through medical school, we've gotten this 140 over 90 number ingrained in our heads, in our brains. So this is pretty, this is pretty startling recommendation that we're going to allow in, in older patients, if you're more than 60, we're not going to treat your blood pressure unless the top number is over 150. Yes, sir? And why would that be? So I'm going, to go, I'm going to show you that in a few slides. There have been a lot of studies that have come out in the last 10 years, and I'll, and I'll show you some of those studies that have showed it could be potentially hazardous and no benefit to treating blood pressure like that. So if you're older than, some more guidelines here, if you're older than 18 and you have chronic kidney disease or diabetes, then our blood pressure threshold is going to be 140 over 90, that's for starting therapy, and our goal is less than 140 over 90. So going back to the previous slide, if you're older than 60 and if you have chronic kidney disease or diabetes, then our goal is still going to be to treating and starting therapy at 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury. So how do we treat high blood pressure? Well, there's a lot of education points to go over. Uh, first, diet, exercise, losing weight. I'm going to talk about uh, number one there in a little bit more detail later on in my, in my talk. Uh, number two, you need to quit smoking. I talked about how these risk factors are additive. If you're smoking, I cannot tell you how important it is to stop. I know that's easier said than done, uh, but it's, it's a risk factor. I can't cure you of high blood pressure. I can't cure you of diabetes. I can take away, or you can take away, smoking as a risk factor by stopping the cigarettes. Number three, reducing alcohol intake. I'll talk about that also, a little bit more detail about what is a good amount or an okay amount of alcohol to drink with regards to blood pressure. And finally, number four, what we usually get to in a lot of patients are medications. So this, these were also new recommendations coming out. Uh, from uh, National Guideline Writing Committee, which medications to use. In our non-black patient population, we're going to choose from one of the following. Number one's a thiazide diuretic, so that would be like hydrochlorothiazide or HCTZ, if you're familiar with that medication. Calcium channel blockers, that's like Norvasc or Diltiazem. ACE inhibitors, like lisinopril or enalapril and angiotensin receptor blockers, medication like Losartan. Some of you may be on these medications or heard of these medications. So um, these are going to be one of your first-line therapies. The old guidelines had said you need to use a thiazide diuretic first uh, in, in most patients. Now they're giving us a choice out of one of these four medications to go with. 
Now in our general black population, we're going to choose either a thiazide diuretic or a calcium channel blocker, and that has to do with the mechanism of high blood pressure in the black population. It responds better to thiazide medications or calcium channel blockers. Now in all patients, if you have concurrent chronic kidney disease, and some of you may be asking, well, how do I know if I have that? That's, a, that's an easy, easy way to test for that is with blood work. Your doctor, you, I'm sure, is getting what are called creatinine levels. That's a rough estimate of your kidney function. That gets drawn on routine blood testing when you go in for your yearly or six-month blood work. So if, if, if your doctor's checking that, if you're going for regular doctor visits, you probably know whether you do or do not have CKD or chronic kidney disease. If you have that, then the guidelines say to start with an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker, again, because the studies show that those medications help improve the kidney function in addition to controlling blood pressure. So how do we start and dose medications? Well, the committee says if blood pressure goal is not reached in the first month, then you can add a second and a third drug if needed from the recommended classes. So if the hydrochlorothiazide doesn't work after you've been on that for a month, then your doctor may reach for Norvasc or Lisinopril. So he, he or she will then choose from one of the other classes that are recommended. If the blood pressure goal is still not reached, then you can use drugs from other classes that are not listed here, like beta blockers, like metoprolol, or medication like hydralazine, another blood pressure medication. Uh, now, how do we dose these medications? How do we prescribe them? Uh, the National Guideline Committee gave doctors three options for how to dose the blood pressure pill. So your doctor can choose, might choose any one of these three, and all of these three are within current guidelines. The first would be to pick one drug and say, we're going to maximize that drug. They usually start you out on the low dose of the medication, and then on your follow-up visits, they will titrate up that medication and increase it to effect, trying to get the blood pressure under control. The other uh, route you could go is you could add a second medication before reaching the maximum dose of the first drug. Or, number three, you could start with two medication classes separately or as a fixed dose combination. What's a fixed dose combination? So now a lot of these medications are sold uh, none as generics, I don't believe, but as, as brand names in combination. So you can get an ACE inhibitor combined with a calcium channel blocker or an angiotensin receptor blocker combined with a calcium channel blocker. There's even some uh, formulations of all three of those drugs, calcium channel blocker, diuretic, and an ACE inhibitor, or ARB, in the same medication. So you're getting three pills in one. You say, well, why, why would you start with number three? Why would, we, why would you start with two medications right away? I just got diagnosed with this problem. I don't want to take so many pills. Well, it's also important to realize when you look at studies uh, that get people to their goal blood pressure, that it takes an average of three medications to get the blood pressure under control. So I have patients worried about this with me in clinic all the time as we're working on getting their blood pressure under control. Doctor, do I need to add the, really add this other medication? Uh, am I some kind of rare case that you're adding a third and fourth pill? And I tell them, no sir, no ma'am, don't worry about that. The average of getting get the blood pressure under control it usually takes three or four medications. So especially if you're starting out at a higher blood pressure, let's say you walk in you, and, and to your doctor's office and your blood pressure is 170 over 100, very high reading, your doctor may want to go ahead and start with two medications or one of these fixed dose pills um, as, as a way to get that under control sooner. So why these changes? Somebody asked the question, why, why these changes? I just want to uh, highlight a few studies that have come out here in the last five years or so. Um, these are, are um, uh, randomized, uh, cl clinically controlled uh, studies uh, of, of patients, thousands of patients in these studies control, trying to control high blood pressure. So a 2008 study looked at low-risk patients who were older than 80 years old. Systolic blood pressure less than 150 was not really beneficial in that patient population. Another study in 2008 high-risk patient population, average 68 years old, systolic blood pressure less than 130 was no better than less than 140. Another one in 2009, high-risk patient 66, systolic blood pressure of 130 was considered optimal. Uh, and uh, in 2010, Accord BP, this was an important study, this is really what changed how we treat blood pressure in diabetic patients. Uh, this was a high-risk patient population of diabetics, average 62 years old, if you got their blood pressure less than 120, they did no better than if you had your blood pressure less than 
140. So that again went into why the guideline committee changed the recommendation for diabetic patients. So that's blood pressure. And now we're going to talk about cholesterol. Clint is here to help me with that with his great movie, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. I had a question on blood pressure. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, what about low blood pressure? Because below certain numbers, I would think there's also a danger. Do you have any numbers to throw out? Like if your systolic is below 80 or something, you're in trouble or what? Sure, sure. I think um, you mean in the, if you're being treated and the blood pressure gets too low, no, you just mean in general? I've had mine where I feel like I'm ready to pass out. Sure. Exactly right. You, you've hit the nail on the head on one of the problems, what, what's going on with why we've also loosened these guideline recommendations on a lot of these patients, pop, on patient populations, is that we often overtreat the blood pressure. And if you do that, then you end up with blood pressures, like you said, of 80 over 50. Right. You know, I think uh, as, a, as a rule, I say anything less than 90 uh, for the top number uh, is something you probably ought to call, with, regardless of how you're feeling, probably something you ought to call your doctor about. If it's low and in the 90s, and you, definitely if it's less than 90 and you're feeling symptoms, like you're feeling faint, again, that's a reason to call uh, your doctor. Okay. Good. So the good, the bad, and the ugly of cholesterol. Cholesterol is a uh, soft, fat, soft, waxy substance found among the lipids or fats in the bloodstream and in all of your body cells. It's an important part of a healthy body because it's used to form cell membranes, some hormones, and is needed for other functions. Pregnant patients, pregnant women, are not allowed to go on cholesterol medications. Why? Because the developing baby has to have cholesterol for its normal development of its cells. So we need a certain amount of cholesterol for sure, but when it gets too high, so high levels of cholesterol in the blood, it's what we call, referred to as hypercholesterolemia or hyperlipidemia. Uh, this is a major risk factor for coronary heart disease, which then ends up leading to heart attacks. In general, we'd like to see all individuals have a total cholesterol of less than 200. However, that's really not something in the new guidelines, so we kind of can kind of forget about that number. It's more about looking at certain patients uh, that are standing to benefit from cholesterol medications, and I'll talk about that shortly. So how does our cholesterol get high? Well, one is genetics. That's something we can't do anything about, right? Um, I'm on cholesterol medications. My parents have long history of heart disease, um, uh, and, and uh, familial hypercholesterolemia is really not that rare of a genetic disorder. Uh, if you have it really, really in a severe case, that's more rare, but you can have different uh, forms of familial hypercholesterolemia, which can end up leading to high cholesterol levels, uh, and then that's genetic. Can't do anything about that. Uh, you, you get your blood screening checks at your doctor's office. You pick that up uh, that way as far as the cholesterol levels being high, and you go on treatment. But really, the main reason why our cholesterol goes up here in the U.S. is our diets. And you know, I have a picture of Ronald McDonald there with a ticking time bomb, because that's really what it is. Uh, it's something that you know, tastes good to, to get, quick, quick food, but at the same time, it, this is what contributes to the cholesterol readings being so elevated uh, here in the U.S. So how do we treat this? Well, number one on the list are the statin medications. So those go by the brand names or trade names of uh, Crestor, Lipitor, Zocor, Pravacol. And then there are other medications you can use as well, niacin, uh, fibrate therapy like gemfibrozil, or Zetia, also known as azetamibe. Uh, the guidelines really emphasize using statins first and foremost, um, and, and want that to be used as first-line therapy when we talk about cholesterol levels being too high. And of course, we want to talk about diet and exercise in all of our patients, uh, going back to the fact that a lot of our diets here in the U.S. are so uh, cholesterol-laden. So let's break down the cholesterol panel that you might get at your doctor's office. Facts about the HDL are what we call the good cholesterol. This stands for high density lipoprotein cholesterol and is found to be a protective substance. HDL is known to increase with smoking sensation, reduction in body fat, as well as large increases in exercise. Now what numbers do we want here? So this number we want higher. We don't want it to be low, we want it to be high. So in general, the higher the level, the better. This is thought to be protective. And at least, so we want this to be at least 40 in men and at least 50 in women. Now let's talk about LDL. This is the bad cholesterol. If you hear talk about the bad cholesterol, this stands for low density lipoprotein. It's the major cholesterol carrier in the blood. If too much LDL cholesterol circulates in the blood, it can build up in the walls of arteries, 
feeding the heart and brain, and then that leads to this problem here of significantly narrowed uh, blood vessel arteries. Together with other substances, it can form plaque, which is a thick, hard deposit that can clog our arteries anywhere in our body, basically. And then there is what I call the worst cholesterol. So LDL, you can actually break that down. There are certain uh, lab tests that you can do that can break down LDL a little bit further than just saying, uh, here's a number of your LDL level. And so uh, LDL concentration can actually be what we would consider quote unquote normal. There's a certain kind of LDL that's very atherogenic or sticky or pro-plaque forming. These are small dense LDL particle sizes. They have easier access and they're more toxic to the vascular endothelium, which is the lining, the inside lining of your blood, of your arteries. And it's much more pro-atherogenic, so more pro-plaque forming than larger size LDL particles. So what should, what should your cholesterol be? We used to have this uh, uh, formula that we would use to calculate risk factors and then help the patient decide what kind of, what number they needed. That's all gone. Don't do that anymore. Then you get those risk factors. Depending on what the risk factors there are, then you decide on what your LDL goal should be. This is also gone. This is all gone from the cholesterol, new cholesterol guidelines. So the, the panel, uh, which released their findings, uh, I believe in November, um, wanted to focus on two things then. Instead of looking at these numbers, instead of looking at numbers of where your LDL cholesterol should be, instead of looking at numbers of where your total cholesterol should be, they want to focus on two points. Focus on the intensity of the statin therapy. We know from many studies how these uh, different cholesterol pills at their different do doses, how well they're supposed to lower the cholesterol. So we want to focus on intensity. Who needs moderate or high intensity statin therapy? And then number two is which groups get benefit. And so basically they got away in, in these new guidelines from using numbers as targets. This is pretty startling stuff. Um, I mean, this is something that is going to take us as cardiologists, primary care doctors, uh, a lot, uh, I think some time to relearn because we've been working with our patients for so long. We have cardiovascular disease and diabetes and we see their cholesterol, LDL cholesterol still being 110. And we want it to be less than 70. And so we got to go up on the cholesterol pill and, and, and change or add something else. We're getting away from all that now and how we treat cholesterol. So who should be on statins? Well, there are four groups that have been identified that get clear benefit from being on statin therapy. So the first group is patients who have established heart and vascular disease. So if you've had a heart attack, if you've had a stent, if you've had bypass surgery, uh, if you've had a carotid artery uh, endarterectomy, uh, carotid artery cleaning, neck artery procedure, uh, all of these are patients who would need to be on a statin. Number two, if your LDL, your bad cholesterol, is more than 190, then uh, you need to be on a statin. That's a very high elevation. Uh, you need, that needs to get treated. Number three are our diabetic patients. So still, diabetes, uh, still diabetic patients need to be on statin medications as well. And then number four is the most controversial part of the new guidelines. And this is probably something you may have also heard about and read about. Uh, the committee identified a group of, of patients uh, saying that if, if you uh, uh, have a more than 7.5% 10-year risk of developing cardiovascular disease, you need to be on a statin. So how do you get to that number? Well, the committee came up with a calculator, a formula to use. And yes, there's an app for that, by the way. Uh, I have it on my phone now. It's free uh, in, in the iTunes store. Um, and it's a good way to be able to you can plug your numbers in. They're very easy. You ask for your blood pressure. It's based on your blood pressure, uh, age, if you're a cigarette smoker, your race. Um, and, and then uh, through a formula, it gives you, it spits out a number, calculates a number that's your personal 10-year risk of developing cardiovascular disease. If that's more than 7.5%, uh, then you should also be on statin therapy. Now also, this is also for patients who are only less than 75 years old. So 80-year-old patient who puts in their numbers and they get an 8.8% uh, risk, uh, they should not be on statin therapy. The uh, guideline committee gave us the option of starting statins in that patient population, but they wanted to emphasize that we really have no studies, we don't have any data sig that, that's significant in, in terms of primary prevention in patients who are older, seven, <coughs> older than 75 years. If, if you have established heart and vascular disease, if your LDL is more than 190, or you have diabetes and you're 80 years old, yes, you need to be on a statin. But if we're doing it for primary prevention, you don't need to be on a statin at this point because there's no data for that. 
So which statins to use? Well, uh, here the committee helped us out and, and uh, identified those drugs, those particular statins, uh, which we know are going to get uh, a good amount of LDL lowering. So what we consider high dose means these are, these are the uh, statin drugs that are going to get you more than 50% lowering of your LDL or bad cholesterol. Moderate dose are those that are going to get you between 30 and 50% lowering of your LDL cholesterol. So the high dose drugs, and, and I put the brand names here, just I assume that folks are probably more familiar with those, uh, Lipitor 40 or 80 and Crestor 2040, and then the moderate dose of Lipitor 1020, Crestor 510, Zocor from 20 to 40, Pravastatin 40 to 80, Lovastatin 40. Uh, in general, going back to this slide, uh, we want patients to be on the high dose statin if they can tolerate it. If they can't tolerate that because of side effects, uh, then the option is given to move to a moderate dose statin uh, in, in, those, in those groups. So the calculator has a lot of controversy behind it. It generated a lot of responses, a lot of editorials. Um, and, and if you wanted to look for it online, you, you do a search for, it's called the pooled cohort equation calculator. Um, and this estimates your 10-year risk of cardiovascular disease. Again, if it comes out to more than 7.5%, then you should be on a moderate to high dose statin. Now the controversy about this was that this particular formula had not previously been tested in any kind of clinical trial. So the committee s looked at the risk factors, came up with this formula, but it hasn't been looked at in, in big studies. We have a lot of other calculators um, that are available to us that we use to assess somebody's risk of developing cardiovascular disease. Those uh, calculators, those formulas have been looked at in a lot of different studies. This one wasn't. There was even uh, one group that came out almost so very soon after these new guidelines were published and they presented data from their own uh, hospital where they used the calculator and applied it to their patient population and they suggested based on their data that this calculator is going to greatly overestimate your risk of, of, of cardiovascular disease and that it's going to put way more people on statin drugs that need to be. So that, that was a lot of the controversy behind it. Now. When I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about that uh, and reading about that and reading people's opinions, uh, I think I'm okay with, use this, with using this calculator and I think I'm in favor of it and here's why. Uh, we got to realize that statin drug therapy is very effective in lowering cholesterol. As I told you, the high dose statin drugs can get more than 50% lowering of your LDL cholesterol. The average LDL cholesterol of, of looking across all patients here in the U.S. is 130, okay? Cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of people here in the United States. So if we are going to make a dent in that number one ranking, we have got to get LDL cholesterols lower. And I think statin drugs are the best way to do that. Let me also emphasize they are very, very safe. These drugs have been looked at in thousands of patient studies. Uh, it decreases your risk of first heart attack and second heart attacks. There's very, very small risk with taking these medications. So the two big side effects you're probably aware of or have heard of. The big one are muscle aches, and, and I definitely see that in my patient practice. Um, it, unfortunately, it's something that definitely happens. If the patient gets it, it becomes too much for the patient to be able to deal with, then we either have to stop the statin or we can try to lower the dose of it. Sometimes the lower dose is better tolerated than the higher doses of, of the statins. Uh, the muscle aches are reversible. So it's, it's not causing any kind of permanent damage to your muscles or permanent damage to your body. Once you stop the statin, the symptoms go away. Now some people, and I'm, I'm a proponent of this, there are small studies, that, not big studies, because coenzyme Q10 is, is an, as you know, over-the-counter uh, supplement. So it's not going to get tested in some kind of big pharmaceutical-driven thousand patient study trial. However, there are small studies that have shown that taking coenzyme Q10 with your statin decreases these muscle ache side effects. So in patients who I really, really need to be on a statin, they've had bypass surgery, they've had multiple stents, I try to suggest that as, as an option. Then the second thing to consider and talk about are, is liver testing. You've probably heard about that as well, that statins can affect your liver. That's true. They can cause a transient uh, elevation of your liver uh, blood tests. That's all it does. Once you stop the medication, those tests go away. It does not cause liver failure. It does not cause any kind of permanent liver damage. It does go through your liver, so if you have liver disease, 
uh, like cirrhosis uh, or some other kind of liver disease, then we would not want you to be on a statin medication. Um, but in general, uh, the liver testing uh, is, is something that we don't even have to do anymore. The FDA actually came out in the last couple of years and said that, that that can be optional as far as checking your liver tests uh, with regards to following statin, uh, uh, people on statins. So again, here's the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, good, normal artery. The bad, our, our plaque starts to build up uh, in our heart arteries uh, all over our bodies. And then the ugly is, is significant uh, narrowing of our heart arteries, which ends up leading to decreased blood flow in the heart, uh, causing angina, chest pain, uh, heart attacks, and eventually, ho hopefully not, but can cause congestive heart failure. So here's my soapbox uh, for this talk. I want to get on that for a minute. And uh, I, 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 I was mentioned that I uh, was at Baylor in Dallas before I came here. And uh, I had the privilege of working uh, with Dr. William Roberts uh, there. Uh, he used to be the director of the NIH. Uh, he's the world's foremost cardiac pathologist. And uh, just in my conversations with him, and this is something he, he uh, likes to say, if, if you should be on a high to moderate dose statin after you've had a heart attack, which is what the guidelines say, then why not before? Uh, lowering blood pressure and sugars is hard, like we talked about. I told you for blood pressure, you usually need three medications. Diabetes, we're talking about insulin, medications, checking your blood sugar frequently. Statins are safe, easy to take, and they work. They're once a day pills. Again, they're safe. I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, and, and they really work very well in lowering your cholesterol and they are tested in preventing first and second time heart attacks. Like I mentioned earlier, the average LDL in the U.S. is 130. Um, going by the old guidelines, we, we used to say that the LDL needed to be less than 70 in patients who already had <coughs> cardiovascular disease. Uh, so that would be a 50% lowering to get from 130 uh, to 70. Let's talk about another risk factor called metabolic syndrome, which is something I, I bet many of you have not heard of. And I wonder about this being a truly silent killer because in metabolic syndrome, you can have some very minor abnormalities in multiple risk factors such that you don't meet criteria to go on therapy. But if you've got a, a, enough of these abnormalities, then you meet criteria for metabolic syndrome. And I'll show you shortly how metabolic syndrome is a very important risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So metabolic syndrome has five different components to it. Starting at the top, hypertension, if you have a blood pressure reading of more than 130 over 85, again, that's not gonna be our cutoff for starting therapy in hypertension. If you have uh, impaired fasting blood sugar of more than 110, again, not gonna be your cutoff for diabetes, but still high. If you're obese, which is considered by the metabolic syndrome, if you've got a waist size, if you're a man, more than 40 inches, more than 35 inches if you're a woman. HDL cholesterol, remember that's the good cholesterol I talked about. We want that to be high. So if it's less than 40 in men or less than 50 in women, then you have one of the metabolic syndrome criteria. And then finally, the triglycerides. That's another component of your cholesterol panel when your doctor checks your cholesterol. And if it's more than 150, that ends up also meeting one of the criteria for metabolic syndrome. If you have three of these five, then you have metabolic syndrome. And that is a very, very important risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And here's a slide showing that. This is the prevalence of coronary heart disease by <laughs> metabolic syndrome and diabetes in a patient population over 50 years old. So starting here on this part of the slide, this is patients who have no metabolic syndrome, no diabetes. Patients who have metabolic syndrome, no diabetes, diabetes and no metabolic syndrome. And this is their prevalence of coronary heart disease. You see, if you have metabolic syndrome, and even if you don't meet criteria for diabetes in this patient population, you had a higher chance of having coronary heart disease. Of course, if you meet criteria for both, like I said, these risk factors are additive. They end up then really increasing uh, the, the chances of you having coronary heart disease. So we'll talk about diet and exercise now. And I think Homer Simpson said it best. If something's hard to do, then it's not worth doing. I know that's the way a lot of people feel about diet and exercise. Um, but still it's something that we really want to try to focus on uh, in all of these problems that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. Exercise is, is easier said than done. It uh, has numerous beneficial effects on blood pressure, glucose levels, cholesterol. It lowers all of those over time. Uh, most important when we're trying to pick an exercise activity for a patient, I think it should be an activity that you enjoy. If you don't like walking on a treadmill, then don't make that your aerobic exercise. Uh, if you like stationary bike riding, if you like swimming, these are all things that you can also do. And also important, every little bit helps. Just because you only go twice a week 
and somebody else is going five times a week, don't feel defeated. I think every little bit helps of exercise and ends up contributing to decreasing your uh, cardiovascular uh, uh, risk factors. Um, so what do I tell patients? I tell them to start slow and consult their doctor. I think that's very good advice. A uh, good goal, what the American Heart Association recommends, is 30 minutes of aerobic activity most days of the week. Uh, I like to always put in a plug for cardiac rehab since uh, that's an area of cardiology that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, it's a great place to start. If you have certain diagnoses, um, then you can qualify for it. Your insurance actually pays for it. Uh, sometimes patients have diagnoses, they're not referred uh, to cardiac rehab, but you can ask your doctor if you qualify uh, for cardiac rehab. Going back to metabolic syndrome, like I said, um, all of those numbers don't meet criteria to get treated. So you may not go and meet criteria to start diabetes medications. You may not meet criteria to start blood pressure medications. So when we identify metabolic syndrome, then what do we do about it? Well, we want to first talk about exercise and diet and lifestyle modifications to watch these risk factors before they get out of control and you end up with full-blown diabetes or full-blown hypertension. Let's talk about diet. A uh, diet is really a numbers game. To lose one pound, you must burn 3,500 calories more than are consumed. So that ends up being average 500 calories per day over the course of a week. So for example, if you reduce your caloric intake by 300 per day and you increase your daily activity to burn off an additional 200 calories, then this should result in a weight loss of one pound per week. So what are some more tips? There are a lot of dietary changes that, that you can make, some, some quick, uh, easy things to do. I, I like to tell people to choose lean meats and poultry without skin and prepare them without added saturated and trans fats. Uh, one of my favorites is to select fat-free and low-fat dairy products uh, in, in that aisle of the grocery store. Uh, cut back on foods containing partially, partially hydrogenated uh, vegetable oils to reduce your trans fat intake in your diet. Cut back on foods high in dietary cholesterol. Aim to eat less than 200 milligrams of cholesterol each day. Cut back on beverages and foods with added sugar. So I think diet drinks here are, are, are helpful. Uh, some, more diet, some, some more diet tips. Choose and prepare foods with little or no salt. Salt is a big contributor uh, to, to blood pressure. And, and so I, it's something I always like to try to go over uh, with my patients as well. Uh, make sure you're reading those labels. There's a lot of hidden salt. A lot of patients tell me, well, I don't add any salt. But then I start talking about them with their diet, and I'm hearing, oh, I, 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 take, I eat a can, can of soup a day. Well, a can of soup has got a lot, a lot of sodium in it. Bag of potato chips, a lot of sodium in it. So even if you're not adding salt at the table, you've got to read those labels. <laughs> and I, I think we just served you guys probably a couple of grams of salt, I'm afraid to say. Yeah. So, um, so that's something else to keep in mind. Um, also, there, there's apps, you know, not to get on the iPhone kick or, or everybody's smartphones, but, but it's really great. That there are a lot of free apps that are excellent for, for calorie counting and salt counting. And when you're going out to eat, they can give you a lot of choices, let you see exactly what you're eating. I think those are very helpful to use and also helpful in keeping your uh, a calorie count. Let's talk about uh, drinking alcohol. Uh, we talk about drinking in moderation. What does that mean? Well, the guidelines say uh, from the American Heart Association, two drinks per day for a man and one drink for a woman a day. So what does one drink equal? Uh, one drink would be a 12 ounce beer, a four ounce glass of wine, one and a half ounces of 80 proof liquor, or one ounce of hard liquor. And that kind of wraps it up. I'd like to uh, thank you guys for listening and then I, I would like to take uh, questions. Uh, quick question, do you have a recommendation for Sure. So, question is about home blood pressure machines. Uh, there's not one that I recommend. Uh, I, I think they're all probably pretty good. Uh, I think uh, whichever one is affordable. Uh, I think it's good to find one that can maybe even keep a log for you. That's easy then to take to the doctor's office. Uh, again, there are apps for your smartphone. I think for also logging that. Uh, there's not one in particular that I recommend. Uh, and you know, then also a question often comes up is how often should I check it? And I, I try to tell patients not to feel, not to get crazy about this because I, I think sometimes people get very worried about it and they see one read and, and then they think I got to check it again every hour. And, and you know, I tell people generally, I think a few times a week is probably sufficient. Um, I think that's good to, you know, three times a week or so 
uh, come in and, and that, that gives us a lot of readings to work with when you come in to see the doctor to evaluate uh, your blood pressure control. Do the wrist ones work as well as the arm ones? They should, yeah. Something else I like to tell patients too is whatever one you decide to pick, bring that in to your doctor's visit. Because a lot of times what will happen though is there will be a discrepancy. So those, those automated ones are, are calibrated uh, potentially such that uh, it could be overestimating your blood pressure by 10 points or underestimating it by 10 points. So especially if there's a big discrepancy between the home log and what we're getting in the office, uh, I, like, I think it's a good idea in general to do this. It's very easy. You come into the doctor's office, you check it with your automated cuff, and then the nurse or doctor checks it, and you can see to make sure those numbers are matching up. Yeah. Yes, sir. Is it possible uh, to treat a plaque buildup in an artery, not surgically, but through other drugs? Or right. So the question is, is, can we treat plaque buildup without surgery, without stents, without having to do bypass surgery? Uh, that's a very interesting question. That question has been tried to be answered. Um, the short answer is probably, well, the short answer is absolutely yes. Um, we, there's, there's a, I think that's how these statin medications work in general is, th is that they keep plaque stable that's there. Um, one of the things that is thought to contribute to causing an acute heart attack is you have a stable plaque and then for reasons that aren't clear to anybody, there's a lot of theories behind this, is you get plaque rupture. So a stable plaque ruptures, it rips. That attracts platelets, that attracts the blood clotting mechanisms of your body to that plaque rupture. The artery gets acutely blocked up 100%. This is how we end up with a heart attack. So keeping that plaque stable is what the key is, what the key is I think, and I think that's what the statins do better. Now there have been some studies that have done, uh, I've used a technique that's called intravascular ultrasound, or IVUS, I-V-U-S. And what these doctors did is they put people on high-dose statins. This was, was using Crestor. And, and they used IVUS before and after treatment with high-dose statins. And, and those investigators did prove that there was probably a very, it was very slight, but there is some evidence of plaque regression. Um, now, uh, unfortunately, I think once you get to, you know, the doctor tells you you've got 90% blockages. Um, I'm afraid that with statins, we're not going to make that 30%. So then that's probably going to have to be revascularized somehow. Yes, ma'am. Would just taking the Zidia work pretty well for patients? Right, so a question about Zedia. So um, Zedia is, is a drug that's come out uh, in the last few years as an adjunct or a, another additional medication to use to the statin medications. It lowers your LDL cholesterol by 18%, so not as much as your high dose or moderate dose statin medications. Um, uh, it's, got, it's only one dose, 10 milligrams a day. Um, in the new guidelines, uh, they don't recommend it as some, something first line to reach for. Um, but in patients who cannot, under any circumstances, tolerate statins, then I think Zedia is a good choice. Um, there's not any data showing that Zedia helps prevent heart attacks. And that's where it's kind of gotten a bit of a bad rap and some controversy about it. Now, I personally think that lowering your LDL cholesterol, an additional 18%, though, is a really, really good thing. And so in patients who um, aren't still in the past when we were looking at numbers, who weren't at their goal, uh, and I've got them on a high-dose statin, and we've been over diet, and they're doing everything right, then I think adding Zedia is, is a good option. And then, yes, to an also answer your question about safety with Zedia, Zedia is very safe medication. You can be on that long term. Well, I had tried the statins, and now the leg cramps were always what started in the... Yes, ma'am. So I... Th that's a problem. I mean, it's, it's, it, I'm, it's a lot... It's more, it's highly more reported. Uh, it's high, the re reported numbers of the muscle aches, the myalgias, we call them, the medical term, the reported numbers of the muscle aches are not nearly as high as, as the true numbers. In other words, I think they are, if you look at the package insert, you know, certain percentage of patients are only supposed to get the muscle aches. I think it's higher than that. I really do. It, it's, it is a common problem. Again, there are different ways to deal with that. Uh, coenzyme Q10 might be a way to deal with that. And then also uh, lowering the dose of the statin might also be a way, or trying a different statin, I think sometimes is also an option. Yes, sir. Hypotensive uh, medication uh, really works for us? Uh, I'm not quite sure. I mean, BP is right now high. 
Now I'm suddenly lower my BP artificially. Does the blood reach to the extremity of my body or so not? Because I get uh, so much, you know, uh, bad circulation mm -hmm. while I'm driving. My feet get numb. Okay. Sure. Well, you know, definitely you want to, um, that's probably not a blood pressure symptom. I think definitely you want to talk about those symptoms with your primary care doctor or whoever's treating your, your blood pressure. Um, but yeah, these medicines definitely work. Again, the, the problem is, is that it's, it's really rare. It's, it's, it's more common than rare to need more blood pressure medications than one. Yes, so. my question is, how is working harder now, high BP? high BP, uh -huh. then the lower the BP pressure, then the blood can reach to the like, oh, sure. my fingers or not. Okay. It doesn't make sense I to see. Me. Okay, <laughs> sure. Yeah, again, if you remember the slide I showed of the heart with the wrench around it. So, so you're right. You do need a certain amount of blood pressure. If your blood pressure goes too low, that's called shock. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and yeah, and then people can even pass out. Um, so we, we definitely, you're right, we need a certain blood pressure to perfuse our end organs, our brain, our kidneys, our intestines, our, our fingers and toes, um, but too much blood pressure is going to end up causing the heart damage in the long run and also damage to the arteries and end up leading to strokes as well. There's certain type things, you know, like the, taking the, uh, I mean, the flax off the uh, a blood vessel or something like that, reducing the amount of the buildup, right? Can statins do that? Yeah. yeah again, there, there is some evidence. Where does it go? It does go into floating like an embolism? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, yeah. Smoke. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good question. Um, that's why I don't think there's really a lot of um, support behind the idea. D don't think of the plaque getting less by, per by tens of 20 percentage points. It's not going to do that. But I think the main thing that statins do, the main point the, where they're most helpful is keeping plaque stable and then preventing plaque progression, I think, as well. I think we have time for one more question because I want to leave a little time to do the raffle and get people back to where they need to go. Can we have one more question? Is grapefruit still forbidden with statins? It's generally not, uh, you're supposed to not have grapefruit or grapefruit juice. Yeah, no. that, yeah that has to do with uh, the way statins are metabolized through your liver. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so thank much. Thank you that so much. I, I appreciate it.